everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well. Um, so I've been kind of a slacker on YouTube as of late. Uh, in fact, I've been doing a lot of research and writing articles for my site. And one of the uh, last articles I did was on um, autographs. And it got me to thinking about one of our hobby pioneers, Charles Buck Barker. Now, Buck was, uh, he was a, a major baseball fan. He started collecting in 1922 uh, with the St. Louis Browns pennant chase. Uh, and, and unfortunately for the Browns, they lost uh, one game uh, to the Yankees. <laughs> but it made him a fan for life. And uh, in fact, um, Jefferson Burdick relied uh, very heavily on Burdick's knowledge of the game because I, I don't think that Burdick actually knew a whole lot about baseball. In fact, most researchers today uh, have said over the years that Jefferson Burdick actually never saw a, a game while he was alive. Um, and this, so this gets me to checklists. <laughs> and um, so Jefferson Burdick actually started out himself as a collector back in, in 1909 uh, when the T206 was uh, hitting the shelves and, and tobacco packages and uh, then there wasn't really too many uh, sets that actually had uh, checklists. Um, some did. In fact, this is a uh, 1888 presidential possibilities set um, from Duke and Company uh, and then on the back <laughs> You'll see that the checklist is about 25 cards. Uh, this one happens to be uh, Arthur P. Gorman, a um, founding member of the Washington Nationals or Senators Baseball Club back in, I think, like 1859. And he was a ball player as well uh, through the 1860s and became a politician. Um, and I'll get to him at some point. So Jefferson Burdick, uh, when he started writing uh, articles in Hobbies Magazine in 1935, he had asked uh, other collectors uh, if they knew how many card sets there were out there and who could be on those sets. Uh, I don't think anybody really knew at that time. So what he did was he asked people, uh, especially in, in his uh, card collector's bulletin, uh, to send in card, uh, sports cards or, or any kind of card really uh, to examine the card and then he would go and try to make a checklist uh, through that and then he'd send it off in the mail again to the uh, rifle owner. You know, and I don't think that would actually fly today. I think the, the, uh, there's way too much money in the hobby for that to ever happen today. Um, but about 1940 through 1942 um, we see the actual uh, first beginning of, of a checklist in, in the T206 uh, set and they, they actually this is one right here um, and so as you can see the only thing that you're gonna find here is the last name and the team and then the back you're gonna have <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna have the advertisement for the cigarette brand um, but he had actually asked uh, Buck Barker uh, at some point to connect the name of the player to his actual face. And so uh, Barker had been actually in the, in the hobby since maybe the mid 40s uh, writing. We, we definitely know that he started writing in 1948. I think maybe in 1945, he may have had a few articles. Um, but by that time, uh, Barker actually knew that that um, he could, this is something that he could do. And, and the reason why was because he had a, a very large archive uh, from the Sporting News and the, uh, oh my God, what was it, the Sporting Life magazine? Yeah, so uh, that's, actually, that's actually a very difficult uh, thing to do. And I think Preston Orham, uh, another hobby pioneer, um, had helped him as well. And so Preston Orham, he wrote a couple of books 
on uh, 19th century uh, baseball players using um, articles uh, that he found in newspapers. And that was one of the ways that these two guys were able to uh, connect the player with the uh, team. Um, but it was something completely different when it came to connecting the actual face uh, to the team and the name. And one of the reasons why is because uh, Jefferson Burdick was writing about these uh, sports cards and these cards uh, 20, 25, 30 years uh, after they were issued. And so Burdick himself would, would, would have been um, about 10 or 11, 12 years old when they were first issued. <laughs> and um, Lionel Carter wasn't alive yet. Uh, and um, Bar Buck Barker would have been at least one year old, two or three years, born in 1911. So he wouldn't have had any, any idea. And uh, Burdick also mentioned in one of his articles that it wouldn't have done any good to ask any of the current collectors of the 1930s who were kids at, at the time either because they wouldn't have known. So you're dealing with at least one or two generational gaps by the 1940s and 1950s. And uh, Buck Barker, uh, also not a whole lot of collectors today would know the name, uh, let alone Jefferson Burdick, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of uh, their contributions to the hobby are, are lost to history, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, by, the, by the late 1970s, maybe uh, early 1980s, um, Bill Heitman uh, starts writing articles uh, about the T206 set. And um, he finds a, a lot of really interesting details that were not talked about by our original hobby pioneers. So Bill Heitman started to find out that the factory numbers uh, on the backs of the cards, in fact, let me see if I can show you one right here. Uh, there we go. All right, so here's a T205. And on the back of it, at the very bottom of the card, and this might not come out very well, but on the back of it, you're going to find the factory number and the disc number. And I'm going to go through another article specifically on that and uh, why it relates to the rarity uh, of our tobacco cards. Anyway, um, so Bill Heitman found a lot of uh, different uh, factory numbers, or he related the rarity of the factory number um, to the card. And at the same time, there were a lot of other um, discoveries being made, such as the slow, do slow Joe Doyle uh, error uh, in, in that set. Um, some errors actually go back to the, the time when Burdick and company were uh, doing their checklist of the set. Some were uh, added and some were taken out. Um, and so that kind of brings me to the, the color variations as well. So there, there are a lot of color variations to that set. Um, and, and as far as I remember, there was the, uh, the missing red on the B for the Boston um, Doves, or the, what we call the Braves today. Um, and then not all, not all variations are going to make it into a checklist. So, uh, for example, there's a, I'm just re reading from my notes here. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, there is a uh, 1958 Topps um, Hank Aaron. Uh, we know of at least one uh, variation, which is the yellow uh, vari uh, name variation. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's a variation in the background uh, color as well. It's normally supposed to be green, but you can tell on that card that it's starting to fade uh, from dark green to light green, and eventually it, it, it turns into a, a robin's egg blue, and that's because the yellow is missing in the print run. And so in order to be included in a checklist, normally there should be about 10 cards or 10 examples to be added. 
Um, this card, this particular Aaron card, does have more than 10 examples, but it's not yet recognized as a legitimate error. Um, and some people consider it just a color variation, uh, which may not be an error. Uh, in, in any in any event, uh, it's an extremely attractive card and, and a quite rare card. In fact, I, I actually had an example uh, which I paid about, I think, 42 bucks for, um, maybe about 15 years ago. The T206 set is one of the three defining sets of the 20th century. Um, the others being the 1933 Gaudi set and the 1952 Top set. Uh, it's also one of the most heavily researched sets uh, out there. Um, and we know that the set consists of 524 cards, um, but there are actually more than that. Um, most collectors are not going to be able to afford the top four in, in that set. But in, in, eight, in 19, yeah, I was going to say 18. In 1973, uh, in the District 65 Center show in New York, um, eight proofs walked into the door. And um, they weren't, or they're not added to the regular checklist. Uh, Keith Oberman did a lot of research and, uh, and articles uh, on, on the players in that set, in that specific set, I should say. Um, and, and we're still learning a lot more about uh, who could actually be in that set. Um, there is also a proof of Eddie Collins, uh, bat on shoulder, as well. So. This uh, kind of gets me to the, the thought that um, sports cards and cards have been around since 1863, and we don't know what else could be out there. Uh, every once in a while, there's going to be a new find, um, and it, they usually they seem to happen in, in flea markets, uh, which is, you know, really weird. But it's usually something where somebody has come across something that they didn't know existed before and it makes a huge splash in the hobby and then it, it's almost forgotten about the, the very next day and um I, that's that's unfortunate uh, um I, I find that a lot to be true in the hobby as well there's kind of a short-term memory problem um or just the access to information is a huge problem and it's, it's just not a huge problem in the hobby. It's also a huge problem in digitization of newspapers as well. Uh, I think about 10 years ago, there was something like maybe 10 to 15% of all newspapers were digitized. Now it's maybe about up to 30%, uh, which means that like 90% of hobby history is also gone as well. And, um, we're, you know, we're always finding new things about the, the hobby, and I'm going to continue to, I'm going to continue to do my part, uh, even if I can't speak well. Uh, you know, I'll get better at this, <laughs> this problem. Um, a lot of the guys that I, I see on YouTube, uh, Dustin from Personal Finance Dad in Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous, and those guys make this look so easy, and, and now that I see it, absolutely is not. Um, but I'll work at it, and uh, I thank you very much for your time and putting up with my ums and ahs. So until next time, guys, see you later. Bye.